Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to the March edition of Molten Music Monthly. It's sort of springtime, flowers are coming out and all sorts of wonderful things are happening in, of course, the world of music technology. Like, there's all sorts of FM for reason. System 80 reckons they've improved on perfection. Roland Cloud captures an, another old synth. Tomo behind wakes up and gives us another synth. IK Multimedia give you everything. Aux Tour is an interesting little sampler. Devil Technologies becomes IADA with a sound symphony. Google teaches us all about synths in augmented reality. Conductive Labs have the ultimate MIDI control station. Pittsburgh Modular go on Safari. Cherry Audio has a go at the Oberheim 8 voice. Mimosa has got two fat tubes. Noise Engineering are going to Ruina Your Versio. Traction have discovered Modular with Hyperion. Analog Solutions upgrades the Leipzig to version 3. Dreadbox has a bunch of effects coming out. And Arthur Jolly perfects the analog drum machine. But first, Steinberg have decided to ditch the dongle. How can this be? How, how can this be? We've struggled on dongles for years. I've had this one. I've had this one since 1948. See, it's got tape around it because I kicked it a few times when it was stuck out of things and almost broke it, had to tape it up. This is a special red one because I'm a special, special person. But I do also, in a drawer here, somewhere. Yeah, all right, here we go, see? Look at that. Now that's a dongle. That fella there. Cubase VST32, a whole 32 bits worth. Oh, yes. And that one, this one, Nuendo, that's properly posh. These parallel port dongles, they would go into your printer port on the back of your computer. You could even run two together because they were throughs, you see. Don't get through on a USB dongle. Hmm. Technology advances, so they say. Anyway, these days are numbered. Apparently, Steinberg, who invented the bloody thing, have decided that, oh, we just can't be hacked with it anymore. <laughs> Which is... It's a bit weird because they've always been so hacked with it to the point of hacking everybody else off with it. Because, I mean, we love and hate dongles, don't we? No, we mostly hate them. I think we've always hated them. I mean, it comes about through this idea that it's copy protection. It's protecting their software. Because certainly in the past, there was a time when all software was copied and shared around and nobody seemed to give a monkeys. And the problem was that the people making the software weren't making any money. Or were they? I mean, I've always found that slightly odd because the other big door at the time was Cakewalk and they've never had copy protection. Never, you know. And they did all right. Well, they did all right until they were no longer doing all right. <laughs> now they've been bought out by BandLab. But besides the point, there have always been other doors that don't really fuss around with uh, with dongles or copy protection as such. And they've all they've all been OK. But Steinberg stuck to their guns definitely going to have this forever for always doesn't matter if you break it don't care we'll charge you a load of money for a new one you just have to deal with it and so we do we have it sticking out of our sticking out of our laptops and sticking out of other places and we trip over it and break it and that kind of thing but apparently something has changed i don't know someone must have got fired or somebody moved on something about the heart of steinberg no longer includes the dongle or it could just be that they're thinking up a new way to <laughs> to torture us <laughs> in using their software i mean the dongle is great in one respect because it means you can move from computer to computer and take your software with you essentially the software's not on here this is just a protection but you can install cubase on a hundred different computers and take your dongle around and use each one without having to fuss without having to go on the internet without having to authorize it and so a dongle is very useful in that respect and the downside is that you can lose it and all your software is gone you can break it and all your software is gone and also you can't run it on more than one machine at a time which you can with most other with most other doors so you might have a, a you know a laptop and a desktop and have absolutely valid and completely awesome reasons for having two different systems running at the same time and you could do that with Ableton Live or Bitwig or Reaper or all these other things but you never could with a dongle 
But anyway, this is just a long rambly thing to go dongles, yeah? So apparently, yeah, Steinberg have decided that maybe it's not the great thing that they thought it has been for the last 30 years and 40 years. <laughs> and, the <laughs> and they're going to have a look at perhaps doing something else. And is that all right with everybody? Yeah, that's all right with everybody. Modular Makers System 80 have released what they believe is an upgrade to the Jove filter, right? The Jove filter, got one here, Jove filter, it's the best filter in the world. There's no filter which matches or can come anywhere near the creamy, gooey, Jupiterness of that filter. It's just lovely. Get your hands off. Oi, System 80, stop it. Well, it's too late, apparently they've done it already. And you know what they're going to call it? Jove 2, perhaps? No, no, not Jove 2. They're going to call it the 860. The 860 Mark II. What? What is that about? Oh, I, well, I don't know. System 80, who produced these marvellous, Roland-inspired modules, have decided that there are a couple of tweaks they could do to the Jove. Maybe they ran out of transistors or a certain type of chip or something but anyway they've they've redesigned it a little bit made it slightly smaller because it does take up a fair bit of room in your rack but then it it looks so marvelous that it's allowed to whereas this one the 860 it's a lot plainer i mean it's still very much in that roland vibe it's got the orange writing on it you know it looks great high quality that kind of thing it just doesn't quite have the impact, I don't think, that that front panel on the Jove has. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, undoubtedly, this is going to be an excellent filter. I'd love to have one. Of course I would. But I just feel in pushing for something better, they've somehow lost its character. Not the sound. It's going to sound awesome. This is purely superficial. Me really loving their other filter, being annoyed that they've changed it slightly. That's all this is. But hey, I'm here to talk about gear. So I'm talking about gear. And on this occasion, I'm kind of slightly annoyed that they've changed it in this way. But it puts it more in line with all their other modules. And of course, that's going to sit right. But I just really like everything about you know, the layout, the look and the sound of the Jove. So what have they improved? Well, they've made the input mixer a bit better, as in there is one, as opposed to just having an input and then a second input that you weren't really sure what that was supposed to be about. And now you have level control over each. That's no bad thing. And no, that's about it. Now, apparently they've put a solid back panel on it to stop the spiders getting in. I mean, that's quite nice, I suppose. But they say that uh, sonically, it's absolutely identical to the Jove. So there's that. No change in the sound, just a change to the to the look and the layout a bit. The vibe, I think. Something, you know, something about the vibe is being lost there. But hey, hey, that's only me and I'm not going to do anything with my Jove. I'm going to keep hold of that. So I can happily go on under the illusion that it's the most awesome filter in the world. The rolling cloud keeps on thundering on as it does and we keep getting new old stuff which is exciting, extraordinary. There seems to be no end to where they can go because they have such a historical back catalogue. It's just, it's just extraordinary. So this month we've got the JD800. Now the JD800 was this massive, massive synthesizer that came out when everything else all other synths have been reduced to a completely sleek front panel or with a tiny weeny screen and a knob, maybe a button if they were feeling really daring. And this came out and it was covered in sliders and it had these strange angles going off like it was some kind of 80s sci-fi movie. Control panel in a spaceship kind of thing. And it brought back the lost idea of having hands-on control over your synthesizer. Mad, really. I mean, it just seems bonkers. That period of time where we lost all control? <laughs> on Earth? What on Earth were we thinking? But anyway, so the JD-800 stood out for its hands-onness, but also it sounded phenomenal and was used all over everything, I think, in the early 90s. I mean, you could, on one hand, call it like a Roland D50 with controls. I think that was kind of the idea. Anyway, Roland have reworked it and stuck it into their Xenology software synthesizer thingamajig. If you're not aware, Xenology is a free 
software synth you can download from Roland. Just create a bit of an account and off you go. And into that, they are gradually adding models of all of their uh, synthesizers. So you've already got in there Jupiter 8s and SH-101s and Junos and, and all sorts of things. I really must do a video on it at some point because I, I, I'm quite into it. I'm quite into what they're attempting to do and I've got a lot of respect. Even though people get upset with Roland for not re-releasing all their old synths, I understand that they want to just move forward while at the same time kind of honouring their past but not having to redo it all over again they want to offer you these are the sounds these are the things but we are moving forward and we want to integrate this with a with something else and we can't do that by releasing a 303 or an 808 or or an sh2 or that kind of thing that's too backward looking as far as they're concerned and that's cool they could do what they like you know it's up to them and they own the stuff they're the ones doing the hard work and so yeah there you go an iconic jd800 is now packed into xenology there's a lot of weird stuff going on around oberheim at the moment I mean, in some respects, I kind of assumed, I kind of assumed he'd at the very least retired, uh, Mr. Thomas Oberheim, or, or perhaps even was dead. But he isn't. He's still doing his thing, and he suddenly popped up this month to say, hey, I'm going to release a special edition of the TVS Pro. What's the TVS Pro, I hear you say? Well, it's a pair of SEMs. We all know the SEMs. SEM appears to be the one thing that Oberheim did that everyone remembers, everybody knows, we see it everywhere. Everyone's trying to do one. It's just a, a square block synthesizer expander module. It's just a mono synth, a mono synth voice in a box. The TVS Pro is two of those put together with a little bit of jiggery pokery to make them work. Um, together rather than completely independently. They last released this back in 2016, which is not very long ago, but Mr. Oberheim has decided that it's really a good time to re-release it, to reissue it, this time with a an Oberheim badge on it. And that seems to be what this is all about. I mean, not that it's not all about getting an awesome vintage synthesizer, because that's awesome all by itself. But the timing of this seems to be centered around the name, the Oberheim name. And there's a lot going on with that. There's a lot of shifting and people doing stuff, by which I mean uh, Behringer has attempted to secure that as a trademark. While at the same time, Day Smith of Sequential has also been picking up a few Oberheim related trademarks as well. And within all of this, Gibson, who own the brand itself, have given the name back to Tom as kind of a goodwill gesture for, you know, thanks for all the stuff and we're sorry we didn't make more synths kind of thing. And my kind of guess in understanding all of this is that Behringer is trying to grab hold of the trademark because it wants to make Oberheim clones and, you know, fair enough, that's, that's cool. And so they've filed a trademark application on that, which I think now has been rejected in the USA. And part of that is to do with uh, Tom Oberheim going, no, no, I'm still, I'm still here, I'm still alive, I'm still doing a thing, look, here's a product, bam, there's my name on it. So I think it was very important that he was releasing a product with the Oberheim name on it in order for the courts to go, yeah, look, Behringer, it's not really on you having this name because it is in use, people are using it, people do identify it with this thing over here rather than your thing over there. You know, that's the way of things. And so it's all turned into kind of a, a, a bit of a... <laughs> A bit of a soap opera. But, I mean, fair enough. I mean, it's your name, man. You need to hang on to that, I guess, at the end of the day. I mean, the, the thing that gets me, I think, a little bit about the Behringer thing is that they seem so intent on grabbing hold of these names as if it's important. I don't really think it is. I think if they release synths, we don't, we're under no illusion that they are made by anyone other than themselves. And so to stick Oberheim on it rather than Behringer... I don't think anyone is confused like that or it will make any difference. No one's going to go, oh my God, it's an Oberheim synthesizer. I've not read anything about any kind of synthesizer for a good 40 years. It says Oberheim on it. It's brand new. It must be made by Tom. I'll buy it. Look, it's only a hundred quid. I don't think that's, I don't think that's really going to happen. I don't think people are confused by those sorts of things. I think people are very well aware of what's a clone and what isn't and that's that's all fine i'm not saying that any of those things are, are bad or or wrong i just don't think that we're actually confused about the name and i don't think there's anything to be gained by grabbing somebody else's brand name and slapping it on your product i think we're all bright enough to understand what 
things are and not to be blinded by the idea of some kind of label. But by the by, the TVS A Pro Special Edition is going to be ooh, probably three and a half grand or something for a fat mono slash duo synth that's got Tom Oberheim's name on it. Cool. IK Multimedia have released Total Studio Max 3. Or was it Total Studio 3 Max? I think it might be that way around. The idea is it's everything. Everything. Everything that they do, all stuck into one one bundle. For one bundle price. You know, like Native Instruments do with Complete. Or like IK Multimedia have done with Total Max Studio 2. Total Max Studio. It's got something like over 14,000 instruments. You get Sample Tank 4. You get the Hammond B3. You get Myroslav Philharmonic 2. I have to say that the Myroslav Philharmonic is an extraordinary orchestral set of instruments. It's just totally stunning. There's also Modo drums and Modo bass. You've got T-Rax, you've got Amplitude, you've got all of the other bits and expansions and sounds and possibilities that go with it. Apparently it totals something like 440 gigabytes of stuff. You're going to need to buy yourself a new hard drive. And you can get the whole lot for about 800 quid or much less if you have a product already and you can just upgrade to it. So it's an extraordinary collection of things. And there's another thing I'd like to sit down and do a bit of a video of just to pick out those highlights from it. Because I've been following IK Multimedia for, well, forever since they started, really. And so I've got quite a soft spot for them. And I think they've got a lot of good work in there. I think perhaps the Max 3 is, is too overwhelming to really uh, make proper use of. But you will definitely find in there some real nuggets of extraordinariness, whether it's the effects in T-Rex uh, or the, you know, the orchestral sumptuousness of the Myroslav or some of those sampled keyboards in Syntronic. There's just some, some stunning, stunning stuff in there. Oxtur is an experimental sampler and modulation machine. The idea is you drop in a sample and then you go, off you go, and it kind of starts filling with it. You can put in randomness and probability, you set a few conditions and then it just goes, Whoa, we're going to make something out of this, Ooh, toss it about, toss it about, move things around, patch things, yeah, yeah, that, that kind of thing. It's the sort of thing that's all about algorithms and outcomes. You know, you stick something in one end, it gets processed along a whole line of probability. Would it do this? If it goes that, maybe do that. And it comes out going squeak or some such. And once you've stopped fiddling around in the top section, in the bottom section, you've got more synthesizer controls like some, some FM, some remodulation. You've got delay, reverb, filtering, all that kind of thing just to shape the heck out of it. They've just released an update which also includes the ability to sample directly into it as well as having sequencing inside so you can start really moving things about. But it, it's an interesting place to, to play, to spend some time, to experiment because it really gives you an opportunity to explore the potential of a sample in interesting and unexpected ways. Devil Technologies are known for their touchscreen controllers. Uh, things like the D-Touch, which is a door controller for Cubase and for, uh, for other doors, which gives like an overlay to give you a touchscreen control surface to go over and control all the mixer functions and instrument functions within the door. That's the idea. They very recently changed their name to AIDA and have released a new more of a general MIDI controller. Rather than being a door controller, it can do whatever the heck you like. It's a bit more like a chameleon or emulator of old, where you can create this massively touchable arrangement of sliders and knobs and buttons and macros, and essentially design yourself the ideal MIDI interface for whatever synthesizer, door, lighting rig, whatever it is that you're trying to control. It also contains kind of a, a modular environment where you can wire a whole different load of processes together. So you can have a control which is running all sorts of things, sending out all sorts of controller numbers, controlling patch changes, notes, sequences, all sorts of things can be behind that one control. It's also a place that you don't have to have a touch screen. I mean, it is touch orientated and that's what they're their bag, their vibe is all about, but there's no reason why you couldn't create this wonderfully complex MIDI processing 
surface and then control it with a mouse. Because that's just as valid, you don't have to have fingers in there to control it. Because the underlying technology, what it's attempting to do, the way it can control all sorts of things in different places, is phenomenally powerful, even if you're just moving one parameter at a time. I confess that it does look a little bit complicated. <laughs> <laughs> now I've meant, again, I mean to do so many things. I have such great intentions and sadly I, I, I don't have the time to realise all those sorts of things. But I've wanted to play with D-Touch for a long time. When, when my life was much more about touch screens, less so these days, and I tend to be more about touching as opposed to touch screens, but I still have a, a, you know, a big healthy interest in that sort of thing. And D-Touch is something that I meant to get around to checking out and never have quite done so yet. So I do plan on checking out this uh, Sound Symphony to see if I can just get beneath the surface, if I can find an easy way in, see how intuitive it is. Could it be something interesting that anyone with a touchscreen or not could enjoy? Now Google went a bit nuts. <laughs> and has produced this fantastic synthesizer and electronic music resource. It's like they decided to, to go around the world and to pull in information from various uh, institutions and societies about the history of electronic music, the history of synthesis, and put it all out there, put it together and kind of wrap it up in a beautifully presented fashion that's, you know, obviously web-based, in order to educate us all on where all this stuff came from. Their, their approach is, is from more than one angle. So when you go into to the website, it asks you, are you interested in the, the music? Are you a, a nerdy person interested in tech? Are you interested in, I can't remember what the third one is, just the history or something like that. And it will take you on a journey, it'll sort of curate your way through the information, showing you things about, oh, there's this studio in Dusseldorf, and then we're going to go off to Indonesia and talk about modular synthesis or... Um, talk about some kind of uh, the origins of the theremin or some French guy who invented the way electrons make noises. You know, all these sorts of things as well as going into historical synthesizers, modern synthesizers, modern music, club culture, studios, electronics, DIY, you know, the whole lot. So you can just spend your time listening to music or learning about craft work or learning about some Berlin club that's been going forever or pop over to Moog and get into the insides of a mini Moog. It's, it's amazing. And then on top of all of that, they've taken some stuff from this Swiss museum and rendered all of these old synthesizers and plopped them into an augmented reality environment. So you can put on your augmented reality spectacles I don't know what they look like. Does anybody have have that? I don't know what that is. But anyway, I'm assuming it's kind of like a like a Microsoft Halo style thing, or maybe it's Google Glasses. Whatever. Anyway, if you have, oh, I know what it is. It's where you get your phone and you look at something through your phone, and you can see the real world. And yet, on your phone, there's extra extra things jumping around. You know, dinosaurs and stuff. That sort of augmented reality. So you could do that on your Android Google phone, can't you? Of course. But anyway, you don't have to do that. You can also do it in a regular browser. The idea that I'm trying to get to is that they've scanned all of these synthesizers in and then they, you know, you plop them on your table through your phone and you can play them. Set things going, put sequences going and stuff. And they've got like a Fairlight, they've got a Moog One, they've got a, an ARP Odyssey, Drum Machine, and you just set it all going and off it runs and you can have a lovely time and this is all free and it's in your browser and you can go and make some music fantastic what a fantastic thing it's called google arts and cultures presents music makers and machines right with all these synthesizers and stuff knocking around our desktop someone needs to sort out the midi side someone needs to sort out how we connect all these things together get them to talk to each other and do something useful without having to be constantly plugging and unplugging cables all the time. Well, in come Conductive Labs with their MRCC, MIDI Remote Control Center? Could be, let's go with that. What it is, is a, is a slab, a slab of stuff packed full of five pin din holes. So you just plug everything into there, bunch of buttons, bunch of lights, go this one to that one, this one to that one, this one to that one, and off you go, your studio is rooted. Fan flipping-tastic. 
just awesome. Not only is it doing the old five pin din, they've also got lots of mini jack type A type B. Ah, those horrible type A type B things going on as well, which mean that if you have a synth that has the annoying mini jack MIDI on it, you can route those directly in as well. And they've got some USB ports too. So whatever sort of MIDI your device takes, you can plug it all into here, route one to the other, Bob's your uncle, fans your aunt, and off you go. Fantastic. It's got a little screen, does something or other, probably. Uh, they talk about they might build in some some MIDI tools like a MIDI monitor or a sequencer or something like that. But for the moment, the plan is you just route everything to everything else. You've got complete control over where everything is going MIDI wise. Of course, back in the day, we would have done this on our computers via big MIDI interfaces like 18 8 out MIDI interfaces. You have stacks of those all plugged in, everything going into your computer. And it was there within your door that you did all your MIDI routing. And it's really interesting to see how we don't really want to do that anymore. We don't want to spend time sitting on front of a screen doing that sort of thing. We'd actually much rather have the physicality of cables going into a box that I can physically allocate to different things. It's the physicalness of it. It's that visceral, touchy, feely, sticky, inny, typey thing. I think that's I think that's what we need. I think it's what we need. It's good. Now, lovely old Pittsburgh Modular have come up with uh, another three modules that have kind of squelched out the side of their research into building more and interesting synthesizers and instruments. It appears that as they're working on uh, new larger things they come up with ideas that they think these are just too good we're gonna to have to spin these out as a module by themselves and so they do and so this has resulted in a number of quite colorful um, modules the first one was a flower shop i think it was a little while ago and now we have a giraffe a crow and a gibbon <laughs> a bit odd have to be said a bit odd but they look great They're a bit more colorful than what they usually do so that's always nice and they're seeing these as kind of a little collection, like going on safari, a bit of an experiment in a particular direction of something. And these aren't particularly spectacular. They're just sort of useful little things that they thought, mm, well, yeah, that's a, that's a useful idea. Why don't we put that out there somewhere? Giraffe, for instance, is just a little 2 plus 2 mixer in 4HP. Crow is an overdrive circuit of sorts. Something to do with seeing a flock of crows and deciding that was all a bit overdriven. I don't, I don't quite understand. And Gibbon is two channels of monkeyness. No, sorry, two channels of randomness. I mean, they're all they're all pretty cool, in their own way. Quite you know, individual, quirky. They're only going to make two hundred of each. Apparently, then it's gone. So, yeah, interesting stuff, Pittsburgh. And I'm still fascinated to know what it is you're going to end up with, in the end of all of this research and development into new things. Now, last month, GeForce released their 8-Voice, which was an emulation of the classic Oberheim 8-Voice synthesizer. The 8-Voice, as I said last month, and I said a bit earlier as well, because Oberheim's all over the place at the moment, was 8 SEMs, so again, those little mono synths, 8 of them strapped together into a larger synth. Uh, with a few clevery bits going on. The idea being that it was kind of polyphony before we did polyphony properly. Polyphony properly being everything is controlled by a single control that controls all the voices. The thing that's uh, cool or difficult about the 8 voice is that you have to control each voice independently. So you have to tune all the oscillators independently, you have to move the filters independently. And that makes polyphony a lot of hard work or it makes polyphony really, really interesting. Because every time a new note comes up, it's going to be on a different SEM and it's going to be doing different things. So the potential in sound design, in modulation, in making interesting weirdness is just huge. I mean, I've been doing a lot of this myself recently with the, the Poly 8 module. Did a video with the Poly 8, really long hour and a half video of what on earth can I do with eight oscillators? And it's kind of a similar idea, really, with the eight voice, because you've got eight synthesizers essentially together that you're trying to work out how best to use. Now when it comes to software of course you can solve all of those problems straight away you just write it in that as you control one SEM you're controlling them all at the touch of a button and that is what GeForce did and that is essentially what Cherry Audio have now done with their 8 voice. Same deal, same idea, 
the Oberheim 8 voice emulated, put together, and then enhanced by uh, allowing you to focus in on just one or two of the SEMs and map those controls across everything. So anything you change here will change on all of them. One of the nice things with the Cherry Audio one is that you can set up different groupings. So you don't have to have all or one, you can have two of them together or three of them together or four etc and those groups can be different and combined so you can do strange strange intermodulation with things and that's very very interesting of course the uh, synthesizer forums are full of people going oh well is the geforce one better than the cherry audio one oh, i know this one sounds a bit toppy you know this one sounds a bit oh i don't know whether that's oh. well i have no i have no clue because i mean the biggest problem with the geforce one is it was mac only which was a shame whereas the cherry audio one will run on my computer so as far as i'm concerned this is the better one <laughs> much as i would like to compare it alongside the GeForce One, I am denied access due to my choice of operating system. So, uh, the Cherry Audio is the one for me then. I mean, they both look and sound pretty phenomenal, it has to be said. Although I would say that the GeForce One is a bit clearer. Cherry Audio do tend to go for a little bit of a of a hand-drawn sort of cartoony look on their interfaces which is a you know is a style but the geforce one just looks that little bit crisper but as far as how you use it the sort of sound you get out what it could offer in terms of just enjoying and playing synthesis you really can't beat an eight voice the mimosa eight now this comes from bizarre jezebel which is a great name Great name, any day of the week, who is a, a Russian manufacturer of modular, mostly involving tubes. Great big fat tubes. None of these little tubes stuck in the back of something. No, big, proper, the sort of things you'll find on the top of a 1920s radio type valves. Stick those in, have them sticking out the front. <laughs> and, you know, you don't even have to plug any audio in. You already know it's going to be sounding awesome. In fact, just its presence in your rack is going to make everything else just sound completely brilliant, uh, one imagines. Anyway, this is a, a an evolution of the original Mimosa, I think, that he made, because in the original, the valves, for some weird reason, were behind the front panel. They were out the back, which made it stupidly deep, as well as completely missing the fact that valves look flipping awesome. Anyway, so he sorted that out, stuck them on the front. Then you've just got three controls, I think, a couple of inputs. What does it do? It shapes and saturates. So you bend your waveforms in half and then just warm them up in a deep lava-filled oven. Oven of valveness, a tubey oven. Two of them. It looks totally awesome. You know, you've got to have five of them, really. I don't know where the eight comes from, what, what the eight is relevant to. There's not eight channels or anything or eight things going on. No, I have no idea. But I would have eight of them in a big row. All these valves sticking out, everything just being saturated and warmed and folded. That's what I want. Anyway, he's on reverb. Go and check them out and bag yourself a pair of fat tubes. Talking of, of saturation and, and wave shaping and stuff, Noise Engineering have got another Versio module. This one's called Ruina. Ruina, or Ruina, perhaps. It's from the Latin, to destroy stuff. So Ruina is, is probably more accurate. And this one is basically answering the question, how much distortion can I stuff into one module and still stay alive? And this perhaps is the answer in stereo, of course. Now the Versio platform is is behind a number of uh, recent releases from Noise Engineering. You always end up with the same module but with a different front panel and a different firmware. The idea being that this is all actually run on a on a Daisy DSP that's in the background, and you can load up different firmwares and transform your module into something else. There's been a delay one. There's been a reverb one, and this is a distortion and if you have a previous versio module you can load up the firmware for free that's the awesome thing about this is that all these firmwares are completely transferable from module to module the only thing that's different is the front panel so your labeling might get a little bit out of sync if you start laying up other things but you know i'm sure you can manage so ruina or ruina i suppose has wave folding multi-band distortion 
Somewhere in there, there's 128 dBs of drive that you can go. It makes that sort of noise. Octavizing, phase shifting, and this knob in the middle called Doom. We just add Doom, Doom. Oh, and there's Schmoosing as well, which is rather good. Just hit Schmoosh and it goes and then back again. Fascinating. Fascinating. A lot of stuff going on in there. But if you ever wanted to crunch something, if you ever wanted to tie something in knots, take some audio and just make it cease to exist and then bring it back to life as a zombie version of itself that's somehow twisted inside and is eating its own brains, then I think this is probably the module for you. Now, Reason has had a couple of uh, rack extensions out this month. The first one called Algorithm. Uh, al algor it's like Algorithm, but without the H. I, I don't know what happened to the H. Maybe it got lost in translation. Who knows? Algorithm. The 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 al, the, al, the algorithm. Algorithm. <laughs> FM synthesizer. It's pretty good. I really sort of like the look of it. It somehow managed to bring a, a color other than green to to FM synthesis, which is is quite stunning by itself. What it gives you is nine cells. Those cells can be oscillators carriers, modulators, and other bits. Yeah, shapers and filters and all that sort of thing. So in each of these cells, you drop a, a synthesizer part. This is supposed to be an FM synthesizer, so you're talking about operators, and you are routing modulators into carriers. And you can do them in any way, and in, in any sort of routing, and, and then add shaping, filters, envelopes, and modulation, all that kind of stuff, all going on together. It's It really is a very sort of open... Uh, open place where you can route things to wherever you want them to go and modulate them in ways that, that you'd like to. And I like the way it breaks out of the whole algorithm thing by saying, no, do what you like, put them here, put them there, do you know, whatever you like. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be FM. It can just make regular synthesizer sounds, but it's definitely angled towards doing that kind of thing. And you'll find a whole preset engine packed full of all those sorts of regular FM sounds that we enjoy. So really, Algorithm looks like a like a fun place to play with FM. You don't get to say that very often. The other one is Sine Synth. And this is a little simpler, perhaps, but also potentially more, more complex and deep and interesting for people who really like to, to scratch their heads around FM. You've got a bank of 16 sine waves and 16 ratio sliders, which essentially is controlling the pitch. So at a very basic level, it's more of a drone synth. You've got these sine waves you can play with. You can pitch them wherever you like, put the levels different, and get these wonderful tones starting to emerge. But then what they're suggesting is that you start feeding one into another, and that's where you get your frequency modulation from. So on the one hand, you've got like a drone synth, which then moves into additive synthesis, and they become partials that you're adding harmonics and bits and pieces to. And then you can push it into FM, where you start routing one group into another group and changing the ratios relative to that to get those, those clangy noises that apparently we all really like. But Science Synth looks great, you know, simple, straightforward, you know what it is that you're getting. And it also makes full use of the Reason Modulation engine with like something like 33 CV inputs. Hyperion from Traction. It's a modular environment. Oh, another one of those, I hear you say. Yeah, this is quite interesting. Traction has always had a modular plug-in environment inside itself, inside waveform, inside the door, the traction door. And within that environment, you could chain together uh, plugins initially, but then instruments and then plugins and instruments and absolutely everything else. You could create incredibly complex overlapping multi-layered synthesizers and effects within this little page <laughs> inside traction where you're just doing little cables to each other. It was all completely possible, just not particularly intuitive or uh, easy to access. In fact, I don't think many people knew it was there. So what they appear to have done, although this might be complete coincidence, has pulled that out and gone down. There you go. There's a modular environment. We're going to call it Hyperion. And it sort of does the same thing. You've got all these blocks. A bit like Reactor. It has a Reactor vibe to it, I think. Lots of blocks with lots of little nodes on, nobbles on, that you stretch cables from one thing to another and it all looks... It all looks like some kind of circuit board, some beautifully intricate, complex interplay of, of bits and pieces, which, of course, makes it probably 
quite difficult to get into. You know, years ago, Native Instruments decided that Reactor was just too difficult. It's too hard, so they put a lot of energy into creating a GUI for it to put a front end on it, something like Reactor Blocks, so that you can actually work with it without having to have a degree in engineering or massive magnifying glasses. <laughs> Hyperion sort of follows the pre that idea idea in let's just go back to the building blocks and we're going to put all those there and we're going to wire them together and we're going to forget about having any kind of interface for it. It's not entirely true because there's this interface going on around the outside that gives you access to all the parameters that you're patching together in the middle. I mean, the sound demos are amazing. The, one of the awesome things about it is that you can have multi-layers. So you can have a layer of a synth and a layer of a synth and drop controls from one to another and route those to macros so you can turn a single knob and have all sorts of things modulating and affecting all sorts of other things on purpose as you play. So you've got polyphony in there, you've got uh, effects, you've got every sort of synthesis from sample players, phase modulation, FM, simple waveforms, wavetables, acoustic modeling, everything has its node and can be noded in there and noddled to other things. Amazing, really. I mean, I haven't played with it yet. I've <laughs> really just looked at the demos, but gee whiz, I think it's going to be going to be quite complicated. Now, Traction don't really like to take prisoners particularly. They're not that interested in, <laughs> in making things stupidly simple. They're assuming that you know what you're doing a little bit. And their software is like that. It has like this, an initial steep learning curve. And then uh, it can be extraordinary. I mean, I found Traction and Waveform to be the same. It's like, oh, what on earth? What on earth am I doing? Oh, wow, this is amazing in here. And I feel like Hyperion is probably, it's probably similar. But I've no idea, really. It could be easy peasy. Who knows? Let me know in the comments. Analog Solutions have released an update to their Leipzig synthesizer. This is kind of a no-nonsense, fat, growly, angry desktop synthesizer. Monosynth, that kind of thing. They've decided to rework it a bit. I mean, there's all that thing. It's been redesigned from the ground up. Well, then call it something else. It must have something to do with the previous version. But anyway, what we've got, a couple of oscillators, filter, envelope, all the usual kind of synthesizer stuff. But they've transformed it a bit in form factor to make it more desktop friendly rather than rack friendly. More of a desktop thing. They've improved the sequencer. You've got these eight-step analog sequencer at the bottom, which you can route to either the filter or the oscillators or both. And then you've got an internal digital MIDI sequencer, which is 16 steps, and you can route that anywhere you like as well, inside or outside. They've revealed a bunch of patch points over on one side, so you can now happily connect it up to other bits of kind of Eurorack compatible gear. And of course, it still sounds flipping angry. <laughs> <laughs> flipping awesome. It's sort of a simpler version of the Impulse Command, I think. Similar idea with the sequencer, where it can do crazy things, because it's not just affecting the, the pitch, you're also affecting filters, and it's like having a modulation lane built into that. So yeah, a, an interesting angry synth. There you go. Now, about a year ago, I think, Dreadbox released the Como Rebe, which is this gorgeous-looking stomp box. Kind of more designed for synthesizers than it is for guitars, although you can use guitars with it as well. It has jack inputs, but it also has Eurorack patch points. Very, very interesting. You know how we all love pedals now in synthesizer land because it's a cheap way of getting an effect for something. You just plonk it down, plug things in. It's very portable. You can move it anywhere, use it anywhere, root stuff through it. Sounds great. Very hands-on, growly, growly. Off you go. Well, Dreadbox appear to be releasing a whole range of these in beautiful colours. They all appear also to be using the same form factor. So it's a bit like the chromatic range of modules that they did, where they're all the same module, just with a different coloured front panel and a different firmware inside. These look to be of a similar vein. So you've got all the same stomp box, just in these gorgeous choice of colours. And then, of course, different functionality. The Coma Rebe was a chorus. Um, but these new ones, we've got a stereo delay looper, a stereo reverb, an eight-stage phaser, and a compressor filter. That's all we know. That's all they've said so far, and they're a bit blurred out, so don't even know properly what they look like, except that they look like the Coma Rebe. 
So that's fascinating. I think that's a great idea. I think more synth orientated pedals is something we're perhaps going to see a lot more of. And it makes sense because they could potentially be cheaper, much more portable, use them with anything and in every place. They're not taking up room in your rack, which makes them a whole lot more versatile. Rico Synth are this awesome manufacturer of synthesizers over in Brazil run by a guy called Arthur Jolly. Great name. Great Instagram account, and he's constantly making these fantastic boutique synthesizers. Everything comes in a you know in a wooden surround. There's something about it that just has this 70s vibe. I mean, his whole thing is vintage. He's vintage boutique through and through, and that just oozes out of the stuff that he does. Anyway, he's just released what he believes to be the finest version of his Rico drum drum machine. Now this is a drum machine like you've never seen. Not because it's weird or crazy, just because it's elegantly beautiful. And I confess that the first time I saw it, I assumed that the drum machine was here, this was the drum machine, and that this was some kind of bass synth that went through it. Well actually no, it is the drum machine. It's just that you don't ever see them in that kind of form factor. So you've got the pattern bass sequence a bit at the bottom of your buttons, these orange buttons with these lights, it's beautiful, orange round buttons, whoever does that, real mechanical switches to turn things on and off, fantastic. And then on this part of the console, you have your seven slash eight instruments, you know, you, you kick your snare, your pair of hi-hats, a uh, low and high stick, clunky thing, clap. That kind of thing. And you've got tuning and decay and grit and, and other bits and pieces, the sort of controls you expect to find on an analog drum machine. Because this is 100% analog and it is 100% beautiful. What a thing. I mean, it's just simple. It's just a drum machine. I mean, I've got one here. Look, that's a drum machine. Yeah, we're all quite familiar with that. I don't know why it's on the floor all the time. But this is just realized in such a beautiful you know, honest, somehow real, tangible way. I mean, I've been watching the videos on it just going, that's, that's lovely. You know what I should do? I should just become the owner of boutique synthesizers. You know, sod all the brands and stuff, get rid of all of that. Just get beautifully made synthesizers by beautiful people having a beautiful time. I just need a shed load of money. And then I could do that and I can make wonderful videos about it for you good people. Anyway, it's the Rico drum, costs about a grand, and you can get it directly from Arthur in Brazil. And finally, Toman are having a bit of an event. They're calling it Keys and Frequencies. Now, of course, we were all, well, me personally, was disappointed last year when they weren't able to do the synth reactor that they'd done the year before, that I had such a lovely, a lovely time on. They weren't able to do it last year for, I can't remember why. Anyway, and this year, apparently, they can't do it again either for, for reasons that escape me. So instead... They've got this one day online Uber event where they've invited a whole bunch of artists, creators, makers and music type people to do a bunch of content that we can all sit back and let it wash over us in moments of synthesizer joy. This all takes place on the 27th of March, which is like, well, it might have already happened, depending on how quickly I can edit this video together. It's probably tomorrow or something. But anyway, it's Saturday, the 27th of March, all day long between two in the morning and eight in the evening, I believe. Got all sorts of brands taking place like Korg and Nord and Moog, IK Multimedia, Modal, Roland, Soma Labs, Waldorf, Yamaha, just to name a few. Got a whole bunch of performing artists doing their thing. And of course you've got, you've got a, a bunch of YouTubers. Sadly, not me, but some great ones anyway. You've got Heinbach, you've got Gaz Williams, Bo Beats, Div Kid, Cuckoo. Red means recording, synth mania, and look mum no computer to name but a few. The idea is that you've got lots of stuff happening at once, you've got different stages, you've got like a main stage where you've got uh, Cuckoo demonstrating something about the Nordwave 2. Later on you've got Moog doing something or other with one of their things. And then there's a meeting place where you can chat and talk to Novation about the new circuits, or you can talk to Waldorf about something or other that they're doing. Then at the same time, there's a performance area uh, where Vlad from Soma Labs is going to be making crazy noises. Then there's a, another area called Studio Berlin where, where more noise and stuff and performances are going on. So it's a whole mishmash and crash of stuff happening all at once. And it's going to be run through some crazy online 
sort of software, I imagine. I mean, these things can be a little bit weird to use in trying to work out how to navigate yourself between various places and to see the thing that you want to see at the time you want to see it and whether those all sorts of things sort of work properly. Who knows? But Tomen are going to have a really good stab at it and see what they can come up with. And no doubt you'll be able to watch the content after the event if needs be. It should be a fabulous time. I should say though I am a little disappointed about the lack of women involved in the event. There's like Rebecca um, uh, as one of the performers and no, I think I think that's about it. I think we can do better than that. I think that there's a, a slight better opportunity for diversity there. And it's a shame perhaps that Toman haven't really sort of sorted that out. But otherwise it looks like a fun event. Well there you go, that'll do. I think I think that's plenty. Is that enough? Done enough? I think I've done enough. It felt like a really slow month, but I managed to pack them in <laughs> as, as I normally do. So coming up then, well, probably tonight, or at least Thursday, the 25th, I've got a couple of things happening. First of all, I've got a live stream uh, with this young man who's studying some kind of music creative technology type thing at university. He got in touch with me to say, could I, could I fill in like a, a survey for my research into modular? And I said, yeah, well, I suppose so, yeah, I mean, of course I can, of course I can. Yes, I, yeah, I always help people in the community. That's awesome. So as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, why don't we, I mean, we could do it over Zoom and then it might be easier, but then I'm a bit shy of, of talking to strangers in that way, <laughs> believe it or not. And that's why I thought about it some more. And I thought, well, why don't we actually do it as a live stream? Because if you're asking me damn full stupid questions about modular, then everybody should hear the downfall stupid answers that I give. I mean, that's got to be a, a, a goer, hasn't it? So this Thursday, the 25th, hopefully I can get this video edited in time so it hasn't already gone past. I'm getting together for a live stream, eight o'clock GMT, and uh, this geezer's going to ask me a bunch of questions about modular, how to get started in modular, beginning of modular, and I'm inviting everybody else to come along to watch it and also contribute their own questions. Anything you want to ask about modular, I will do my best to answer in as much detail as I can. And I think that will give this guy uh, a much broader idea of research, a much wider selection of, of questions and possibilities. And of course, a whole bunch of nutty answers from the people in the chat, which is great. I love all of that. So that is happening. 25th, 8 o'clock, live stream on YouTube, usual place. We'll do it. And because of that, I'm not going to be having a live stream this Sunday. So that's going to be our only one uh, for this month. All right. And then later on in the evening, well, really in the morning, over in New York, I'm performing at the New York Modular Society Patchable Performers Event Night Gig thing. <laughs> And that starts at one o'clock in the morning, my time, or nine o'clock if you're over in uh, the city that never sleeps. Or was that Chicago? I can't remember. Anywho, it's a performance I've already done. It's, it, I've pre-recorded it. I did it on this rig here just the other day and uploaded it to them. And it will be the premiere of that performance. The performance was all about uh, polymeters and polyrhythms, two things which I don't usually spend a whole lot of time on. So it has been a fascinating adventure trying to work the heck of that out. <laughs> and then come up with something which sounded not completely rubbish. And I, I hope, and I, a little bit of me believes I did that. So if you're around over that side of the pond, then it's on at nine o'clock on Twitch over at the, uh, uh, well, you'll find a link on the New York Modular Society website to do go and check that out. And then uh, later on at some point, it will turn up on my YouTube channel, I imagine, including I've also done a patch breakdown video. Very exciting. So you can enjoy that as well over the weekend, I imagine. Lots of review videos coming up, including a whole bunch of Volker stuff. I'm going to get really stuck into this next week and at the very least produce something fascinating with the Volker new base. That's the plan. Otherwise, acres of DIY, Deckard's Dream, Deckard's Voice, modular stuff, keyboards, audio interfaces, whole lot going on the whole time. And if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, wow, this is amazing. I wonder how I could help the guy. You can help me by buying a mug. Oh yes, new mugs, Molten Modular. Look, it says Molten Modular on both sides, available in all sorts of fascinating colors that will definitely brighten your day. Put pens in it. 
put coffee in it. Whatever you like. New range of mugs now available on the website. Yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? Like merchandising and stuff. <laughs> well, it is. It's kind of exciting. Wanted to do it for ages and finally got around to it. Now, this is phase one of my merchandising plan. I have all sorts of things coming along the lines. I am I'm currently working with a, with a fantastic illustrator to come up with a couple of T-shirts uh, slash posters. So uh, they're well underway now. So we'll be getting along to those soon. I'll tell you more about them when I have something to show. But ultimately... It's it's just a bit of fun, mug. <laughs> mug. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Anyway, otherwise, you know, join us on Patreon. That's always a good idea. Throw me a couple of quid. That'd be awesome. Do all the subscribing thing. Come along to things. Talk to me. I'm happy to answer questions most of the time about most things. So there we go. I'll just stop talking. And in the meantime, you go and make some tunes.